Hello everybody, how's it going today? My name is Connor, welcome back to another video. Uh, in this one, we're going to be kind of doing a demonstration of what's been going on with my uh, little architecture, CPU architecture, assembly language, uh, assembler, virtual machine, uh, kind of two, um, pipeline that I've been working on. Um, this is going to be just a, uh, a kind of a deep dive, might be kind of a longer video. Uh, where I go in and explain literally everything that's going on. Um, so uh, let's get right into it. So uh, first of all, the capabilities of my current uh, uh, pipeline that I have set up, my current set of tools that I've developed, is I can uh, write uh, programs in my own assembly language, such as right here. Um, and I, I, as you can see, I prepared a few uh, files for this uh, demonstration uh, to kind of explain everything and all that. So, but I can write my own assembly language. And then this assembly language is then compiled or assembled uh, down into um, a binary format that I also kind of made up. Uh, and then that is run on a virtual machine uh, that I also developed uh to interpret that uh, binary code and perform the necessary actions uh in a kind of simulated environment so um and then what can also happen is uh i can take a uh high level language like right now i have a this is a zig program it's a very simple three line zig program with just one function um but it uh um it I can I can take this and I can compile it down uh, into uh, my assembly language as well, and that's through an intermediate step uh, via LLVM, which I'll I'll get into what that is in a sec. Um, but basically, uh, LLVM allows me to take a high level language like this um, and compile it down into a representation that can be interpreted and parsed by uh, my assembly language. Or my, by my by my assembly language assembler by by my by the by the, uh, the thing that can make the binary, so um, and then that is then assembled down along with a little bootstrap in my own assembly language, um, and that is uh, assembled into one binary. So um, anyway, so uh, I'm going to start with the code that I wrote and then the entire rest of what we're going to talk about today is going to be generated automatically. So, um, by code that I wrote, but you know, <laughs> um, so, uh, this is the kind of general, uh, life cycle, uh, of a program like this written in Zig, or I can also do a rest I've done. And I've also done C, uh, anything that LLVM supports at the front end will probably work at least if not with a, immediately, but, but with a few modifications, then, uh, it'll probably work on my architecture. <clears throat> it's one of the advantages of supporting LLVM from the get go, right? Uh, is that anything that it can compile into its, uh, IR representation, um, can be run on anything that it can compile it as a, as a backend, right? So, uh, whether that's x86 or whether that's CAS, so. Um, so we start with, uh, a program written in a high level language like C or Zig or Rust. Uh, in this case, it's Zig because Zig tends to produce a smaller, uh, LLVM code than I've noticed Rust does. Rust likes to, uh, Rust likes to put its entire standard library into everything if you're linking it statically. So, um, whereas Zig only puts the parts that you're actually using. So, um, and, uh, so we start with, a like I said, we start with a Zig file. Uh, this is then compiled by Zig, uh, or if car Cargo or Rust C, if you're using Rust or Clang, if you're using C, uh, into platform agnostic LLVM intermediate representation assembly language and bit code. Um, so let's go over what that means. Um, so platform agnostic means that the code generated uh, by 
uh, the LLVM front end, which is Zig or Cargo or like Clang, um, is agnostic and independent of both what it came from and where it's going. So uh, you can think of the uh, general pipeline in three phases. Um, LLVM pipeline. Uh, front end, uh, which is Zig, Rust, Clang. Um, and then you have the middle end, which is LLVM optimizers. And then you have the back end, which is a code gen um, for x86 or arm or uh you know um or, or cast really so uh so what we have here is the general lovm pipeline is going to be the front end which is rust or zig or clang the middle end which is lovm itself and uh it works together with the front end and the back end to optimize the code and it plans when it's in this ir form um and then we have the back end which is mostly what i'm doing um, which is the generating the code for the architecture of platform that you are trying to compile for, or whatever target, you know, CPU or whatever. So, um, cause they all use different instruction sets, right? So, uh, they all need to have their own way to turn, uh, this into what they can run. So, uh, anyway, so this is the front end part. Um, this is stuff that I don't do, uh, this is, or this is, I, I do it, but like, it's not code written by me. Uh, also one of the code that's written by me is the, uh, the code that's actually being compiled. So then, uh, that, uh, IR representation or the bit code or whatever you want to call it, um, is translated into my assembly language. So just like this is an assembly language program in my, in my CASM assembly, um, this will be turned into an equivalent assembly program. And we'll see what it looks like in a sec. Um, and then the uh, assembly, generated assembly files, plus a human written assembly bootstrap uh, are assembled into one binary. And then that's run by the virtual machine. So, um, we'll get into what the bootstrap does in a sec. Um, in fact, let's get into that now. So, um, actually, no, let's, 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 uh, let's go ahead and build this Zig file so I can show you what the LLVM looks like. And then we'll get into the assembly in a sec. So, um, oh, oh, I need to change the right directory. Um, let's do that. Uh, so that, that just generated a bunch of files. Uh, this was generated by Zig. Um, we have the actual binary, the, the binary library that we created here. Um, and then we have a couple extra files. Uh, we have demo.ll and, and demo.bc. So uh, the LL is the LLVM assembly. Uh, this is different from my own assembly language, uh, although it shares a lot of similarities in what it actually does. Um, it just includes a lot more information that we don't really use right now. Um, and then we have demo.bc, which is just a binary where you can open a hex editor. It doesn't nothing much to look at here. Um, but this is the uh, uh, compiled version of, of this, right? Um, so, um, or the, the, you know, the binary version of this, right? So this is a human readable representation. This is a computer readable representation. So. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, for, I totally forgot. Uh, I was going to talk about what this program actually does. So, um, uh, basically, sorry, this video is kind of scuffed. This is actually my second time recording this. <laughs> um, the first time the audio was kind of messed up. So, apologies if I'm a little over the place. Um, so, uh, basically all this Zig program does is it takes it, 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 it defines a function. Uh, it's an export function, so it doesn't get linked away or optimized away in, 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 the, in, the, in this part. Um, and then 
it, the the function it's called demo and it takes uh one parameter which is a 64-bit integer and then it takes another parameter which is a pointer to a 64-bit integer so um if you don't know what a pointer is uh it's i'm not gonna explain it right now it's uh it's like a a location and memory containing uh something like this so whereas this is passed directly by value this is passed uh as whatever wherever it is in memory where the actual value is in memory wherever it lives so um that's basically what a pointer is it points you toward in the right direction towards getting the actual value think of it that way so um there we go just explain pointers <laughs> so um we pass an actual integer and then we pass the location of an integer um and we return another integer and you know so we return like a take a number we take the location of a number we return a, or we a result will be a, another number and all that number is is just the result of uh the first number plus the we, we go and we go to wherever this other number is and we grab it and then we add it to the first number so that's all this zip code does. Um, it's a pretty simple uh, kind of deal. Um, very kind of like demonstration the kind of program, you know? Um, so, uh, and then when we go into the LOVM assembly, um, we, uh, we can see it's kind of doing the same thing. Uh, if you know how to read this, which you probably don't. So I'm gonna explain it. Um, this is, Define the same thing. This is our function. This is our return value. It's a, see, it matches the one in here because they use a similar syntax, kind of. Um, and then we take our first parameter, uh, and then we take our uh, pointer to our second parameter, right? Uh, or second parameter, which is a pointer. Say. Um, <clears throat> and then. Uh, we do some debug things. Don't need to worry about these. DBG, just debug. It's it's, it's just stuff that LVM puts in there for us, uh, or that Zeg puts in there for us, so that we can do it. If we were actually going to assemble this into something that some people maybe we run it on Linux or something, you know. Um, and then uh, we load that pointer, um, and then we so we grab. Like I said, we grab it's it's at, it, it from its location. Um, and then we add it to the first value, and then that's a result. So um, and that's all we're really doing. So you can see, uh, but this is like an alternative rep representation of what we're doing here, right? Um, and the difference is, uh, this is a lot more generic. It, it's kind of more explicit in what it's doing. So like for here, um, we uh all this stuff like the alignment of the pointer or the alignment of the load instruction and um the signedness of or sign extensionness of the uh add instruction um is all implicit in the zig but it's explicit in the uh LLVM, right um so and it has all this metadata about stuff that zig just kind of you know, we we can assume all this stuff in, in Zig, but in LVM we have to be explicit about it. Uh, fortunately, this is all generated for us by the Zig compiler. So, um, <laughs> and then uh, what we can do is uh, we can go ahead and assemble this into, uh, or sorry, translate this this into something like this with my own assembly language. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll show you what that looks like. Oh, come on. Um, sorry. There we go. It's complaining a little bit, but um, there we go. Because I have comments in here that I didn't consider uh, the, the consequences of. <laughs> so, um, uh, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over what the um, what the little bootstrap is. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Um, and then I'm, I'm going to talk about why we need it. And then we're talk, going to talk about the generated custom assembly. Oops, that's not it. Um, for the uh, ZIG program that we wrote. So, um, so why, we, why do we need this? Why do we need this extra assembly language file um, in order to run something like this? Well, uh, if, you, if you're uh, observant, you'll notice that we, uh, the, the, the command we passed to Zig to compile this is actually a build lib, build library. So that's a current, uh, and that, that was on purpose, right? Because uh, we want <clears throat> this uh, Zig program to be treated as not an executable, but as extra functionality that can be added onto an executable. We, why do we do that? Well, uh, when you build a executable with something like Zig or Rust or Clang, uh, it tends to attach a uh, chunk of assembly language code, a chunk, chunk of native assembly language code, not LLVM, but um, the native assembly, uh, and it will, uh, and, and that's essentially just going to start up uh, the main function. So if you have like a, a pub function main um, void, right? Um, then it would start up the main function if you wanted like uh, um, something like that, where the main function would take parameters like the command line arguments to the, to the program, then um, it would go ahead and set the stack up for that or set up the registers in order so that the main function could have the right values inside of its uh, arguments, right? That's what it takes. So, um, so that's essentially what we're doing here uh, instead, because the uh, normal, uh, we call it the, the CRT0, C runtime uh, entry point, right? Um, so uh, because, that's all written in platform specific assembly language. And because I haven't told Zig how to link this in automatically, um, because that's just not in my agenda right now, and I like how I'm doing it now, um, I need to provide this manually. So this is the equivalent of the CRT0, um, where uh, it's, it sets up the actual function to be run, right? Um, the actual code to be run, essentially. This is the setup for it. So what we have here, right here, uh, the first very, very first line is a header tag. You can see tell because it has a uh, exclamation mark at the beginning. Uh, that's how that's what identifies header tags or preprocessor tags. Um, and all this does is this tells the uh, virtual machine uh, where to put the uh, start of execution, or where, where to start the execution of the program. So we, we tell it we want to start at the start, under, underscore start label, um, and we want to load it at uh, one kilobyte into memory, right? That, that's one kilobyte, um, x1000. So, um, I think. No, sorry, that's not one kilobyte. That's four kilobytes. I'm 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 tripping. Yeah. Or is that sixteen kilobytes? I don't know. Either way, um, something like that. I think it's four kilobytes. Um, but um, yeah. So we have the address of where we're going to load our entry point, and we have the actual entry point where we're going to start our execution. So, uh, this is a data tag. It has an at symbol. Um, so. Uh, this basically defines static values uh, inside of memory, inside the binary, uh, and gives them an alignment so that they can be read properly. Um, and then uh, defines a uh, handle, basically, that is a pointer to this location in memory, or to, to, the value, to this value in memory. It's a pointer to this value in memory, right, in, inside the binary. So... It, like just like the pointer that we're passing into uh, our function, 
this is just re uh, recording the address, the location of wherever this value ends up being stored, right? Uh, so we know how to find it. Um, and then we have our entry point function. So this is a label. Uh, the labels start with um, start with the percent sign. Um, and then uh, we have a, a list of instructions here. So what each instruction does, uh, I'm going to go over it. Um, we have uh, how how each instruction takes kind of takes form is we have an opcode, uh, an operation that we're doing. What what the actual identity of the function is or of the instruction is. Um, we have a, a data type. Uh, so this is the size of the operation. This is how many bytes we are going, or more accurately, how many bits we're going to be reading or writing at a time. Um, so this is going to be a 64-bit integer, uh, just like in the zig file and just like in the, uh, um, where was it, the LVM assembly, right? And we're going to load, uh, we're going to store basically the uh, value uh, 58, the number 58 into the register RG. So there are, in, in CAS, there are uh, 12 general purpose registers. Uh, we have RA through RL. Um, so a, RA, RB, RC, RD, et cetera, all the way through RL. Um, and then uh, these can just hold any value that you want, right? So. Um, then we're going to uh, do the same thing, except instead of storing the number, the actual literal immediate number 58 into our G, we're going to be storing uh, the pointer to our static uh, location in memory, right? Um, containing the number 42, and we're going to load that into our H. So, um, and uh, then we're going to call um, our function, which is external, right? And this is not inside this assembly language file. Uh, this is from Zig. Uh, so, so it's got the same name. Um, got demo. Um, and then notice how we, the size of this call instruction is, uh, 64 bits, right? So all, uh, labels, uh, cause notice how the, we, we identify it with a label, right? Uh, all labels are basically just 64 bit addresses to locations in, in code. Um, so, uh, if I were to, uh, put a label like right here, um, then this foo label would contain the address of this call instruction, right? And we could, uh, jump to it or start executing it anytime we wanted to with like a jump or call instruction, right? So, um, after we're done with uh, our demo function, um, so so the demo function, remember, it takes two parameters, right? Uh, and it returns uh, something. It, it gives us back something. So how that works in CAS is the parameters are passed in through RG through RL, um, uh, depending on how many parameters we have. And then the rest are pushed onto the stack um, and popped off at the beginning of the function. So. Um, that's kind of our, what we call a calling convention in, uh, in compilers and in, 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 in the level querying. So, um, RG basically corresponds to the first parameter. So this is our first parameter is our integer and our H corresponds to the second parameter. Uh, so this is our pointer to our other number, our pointer to another number, right? It's all the same. Um, so, um, and then, uh, we, what was I saying? Uh, we, we, we execute the code inside this function, which we'll get into what it looks like in a sec. Um, and then once we're done, the return value will be put into RA. Uh, the, where we, the results of that function was, will be put into the RA register. And then this, all this does is just prints this to the screen in the virtual machine. And then we halt, uh, we halt execution of the emulator or the virtual machine. Um, and, uh, and that stops the program from running off into you know, nothingness. Right. 
Um, so that's the kind of like bootstrap for this program. Uh, now let's go into what this uh, Zig program and this uh, uh, LVM program actually looks like in my own assembly language. So this is kind of a lot more to go over, um, but I'm going to talk to the parts that I haven't talked about yet. Uh, so this is the label that we we saw in here, right? Uh, right here. Um, so uh, this is what we call the function prolog. This chunk of code right here. Um, where could we this chunk of code right here? Um, this uh, essentially sets up what we call a stack frame, which you can think of as that as like as like a scratch pad area uh, for the function to have some places to store uh, some values that it needs in order to do its job, right? Um, do whatever it needs to do. So uh, you can think of this as like its desk, right? Uh, this is the function's desk. Uh, it needs to have a desk to begin with in order to be able to work, right? Um, so like uh, you could think of it like, uh, we're pushing this desk into place and moving the desk into place, right? It's the push and move instructions uh, with, with the base pointer and stack pointer registers, which you don't need to worry about what those are. Just think of it as like we're setting up the function for a new function. Uh, we're giving it some space by subtracting from the stack pointer. Um, and then we take some, basically some papers, right? Uh, if we're using a desk analogy, these are these RG and RH registers are papers, and we're putting them onto the desk, right? Um, these are two uh, parameters of the function, and then we jump to the entry point of the an actual entry point of the function, um, which is the it just happens to be the next instruction. This could be optimized away, but I'm I'm leaving it in there for clarity right now. Um, so then, uh. We call a couple of debug functions, just like we saw in the LLVM code. Um, don't need to worry about those. And then we have a load, add, and a ret. Uh, and you can see this is actually what we're doing in the LLVM as well. We have a load, add, and a ret. So uh, what a load instruction does in LLVM is it basically uh, reads from memory. So you can use this to dereference a pointer and read from it, right? Um, we, we're going to uh, wherever this uh, second parameter is, uh, which is our second parameter, which is the pointer, right, right here. Uh, and we're gonna say, grab whatever's there and put it on another spot on the desk on, or onto the stack, right? Um, and uh, that's what these uh, square brackets mean, is grab whatever's right there in memory, right? Um, at this location. So whatever's in RC, which is uh, just an address right now, is we're going to go to the address, grab what's there, and put it in here. Um, and then we do our add, which is just another simple case of, you know, moving stuff around in memory. And, and then uh, we add in place. Um, so we move uh, this second parameter, and we add it, to the first parameter, um, or add the first parameter to it, I should say. Um, and then we uh, move that into our RA register, just like I talked about in here. Uh, and then we return from the function. We, we deconstruct our desk, <laughs> we deconstruct our stack frame, um, and we return execution back to wherever it was called from. And then that will end up right here. And we will print that return value to the screen. So um, that's essentially what's happening here. Uh, let's, let's see here. Uh, so if we go ahead and run uh, this program, you will see a bunch of debug output. Uh, I'm going to go over what that means in a sec. But you can see right here, uh, this is our output, right? Which is the, the output of the print instruction. Uh, and we're printing the number 100, which last time I checked. Uh, let's see, where's our values here? 
uh, 58 plus 42 is indeed 100. So math checks out. Um, um, and uh, in this debug output, you can just see it's it's a kind of big right now because I have the text size turned way up for the mobile users. You're welcome, by the way. <laughs> um, and uh, you can see this is just like a step by step of what's happening inside the program. I can also run the debugger. Um, how do I even do that? <laughs> I didn't set up a debug script. We have to type this one in manually. Uh, debug. Um, there we go. If we can actually step use this debugger that I showed in the last video. We can actually step through the program here. Um, so, uh, step through it one by one and see the you know status of the registers. This is going to show our stack frame over here. This is this is our desk, right? So as we set up our, our desk, values start showing up over here as we get more space to work with. And you can see that they're changing over on the side um, as we uh, step through the program and put stuff there. So we can actually single step through the entire program. And then there's our answer that it's, it's uh, the result is 100. Sorry if it's kind of small, by the way. I can't make this bigger right now. Um, but, uh, and then we're halted. So, it's a real simple program, but this is all these sources that happened in order, right? And then the indentation in, in, indicates scope. Like, how, how far deep are we into the call stack? So, uh, how many times have we called something and not returned from it? So, um, yeah. So hopefully that was a good explanation of what's going on here. Um, if you have any questions, uh, leave them in the comments. Uh, hopefully I explained everything uh, well enough. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, leave them in the comments. If you have any comments, leave them in the comments. If you like the video, hit the like button. It really helps me out uh, so that more people can see what the stuff I've been doing. If you really like the video and you do want to see what stuff I've been doing, uh, you can subscribe. Uh, that also helps me out. It lets me know that people are liking what I'm doing and it motivates me to keep going. So uh, other than that, thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Peace out.